funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Rhonda Schaffler in for Brianna Venosi. A school district in Gloucester County kept children out of the classroom today after a threat was made against one of its schools. Classes in the Monroe Township District were canceled after the principal at Williamstown High School received an email about a threat of violence, naming individuals, and the school was locked down immediately. Also today, officials in nearby Winslow said they were investigating an online threat made against Winslow Township High School. These incidents coming as the nation continues to mourn those lost in the recent school shooting in Uvalde, Texas. Last night, President Biden making an impassioned plea, urging Congress to enact tougher gun laws, saying communities have turned into killing fields. The president pleading, how much more carnage are we willing to accept? Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports on the president's plea, the politics behind gun control here in New Jersey, and what one local school district is doing to protect its students even before a threat is made. It's enough. Enough. It's time for each of us to do our part. It's time to act for the children we've lost, the children we can save. Joe Biden pointed to the carnage at Uvalde and delivered a message from anguished victims' families there as the president targeted Senate Republicans last night with an emotional appeal for gun control. They had one message for all of us. Do something. Just do something. This isn't about taking to anyone's rights. It's about protecting children. The president tried to reassure legal gun owners as he pressed for bipartisan compromise on measures like renewing the ban on semi-automatic weapons or at least raising the legal purchasing age to 21, limiting magazine capacities, enacting universal background checks and red flag laws, and requiring gun owners to lock up their firearms. Observers foresee few, if any, political compromises. The, the likelihood of 10 Republican senators getting on board with any legislation that directly addresses firearms seems pretty low to me. Um, but I think that that might not be the only purpose of a speech like that and that it can motivate state level action. Rutgers researcher Michael Anesta says locally, public pressure could build momentum behind a couple of Governor Murphy's recent gun control proposals, but the Democratic governor could get pushback from his own party, still stung and skittish over losses last November. They're really sensitive to not losing more seats, particularly in the southern part of the state, where again, gun culture is stronger than the rest of the state. Riders Mike Erasmussen figures a few select items like safe firearm storage could win approval. Jersey's Democratic majorities already passed some of the nation's toughest gun control laws, and only Massachusetts reports a lower rate of gun violence deaths. Again, we rate really well relative to other states, in large part because there are fewer firearms in the state and less access to things like high-capacity magazines that are used to in, in, in episodes of public mass shootings. Regardless of Aldi's inspired rallies, reignited fears for student and teacher safety here. Middletown's Board of Education just voted to put an armed off-duty police officer at each of its 16 schools until summer break and through the next academic year. And I think everybody would agree that we want our children to be learning in school and not worrying about anything that could possibly take place. Yeah, I think that's a natural reaction and, and I think in a lot of ways it comes across as a logical reaction. However, I'm not aware of any research 
showing that that's actually a robust way to improve school safety. Professor Paul Boxer says research does support placing metal detectors at school entrances, for example. It helps keep weapons out and makes kids feel safer. But the most effective way to stop gun violence in schools? But in terms of the specific issue of guns and gun laws and regulations and prevention, um, there doesn't seem to be any other kind of solution that could be as effective as dramatically limiting access to firearms. We need to remain open-minded and do our research and then uh, take action that's going to make a difference. Middletown's in Monmouth Republican Senator Declan O'Scanlan's district. He's looking at Murphy's proposals, but offered his own, which would require school building safety reviews, plus standardized training for school staff and police officers so they can assess threats and respond appropriately. I don't want to get behind things that are reform in name only. I want to get behind things that are legit, that, that both increase children's safety and, and make sure that we guarantee Second Amendment rights at the same time. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. New Jersey's primary election is next Tuesday, but the polls were open today, marking the first time voters got the chance to cast their ballots early in a primary. Polls will be open tomorrow from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. and on Sunday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. To talk more about early voting, I'm joined by senior writer and projects editor Colleen O'Day. Colleen, it's great to see you. Great to see you too, Rhonda. What was behind the decision to allow early voting for the primary? So New Jersey was one of the states that didn't have any early voting. Uh, we, about half the states do have it. And, you know, one reason that it's important is because, you know, you've got COVID and there are still some people who don't want to go out on election day and be in potential crowds and vote, but but also don't feel comfortable uh, voting by mail. Uh, some people just are concerned that, that when they stick that envelope either in the mail or in a drop box, it may not get to where it needs to go. So this was a way to allow more people to get out um, when it's less crowded, uh, you know, because voting is spread out over three days this weekend. And in terms of where you can cast your ballot early, are there specific polling places? So you you definitely have to vote within your county, but there are going to be multiple locations within your county, um, small counties, like 100 and have three locations open, but larger counties like a Bergen or an Essex have nine. Um, the way you can find your location is it should be listed on your sample ballot that you received in, in the mail, or you can look on the New Jersey Secretary of State's uh, website, the Division of Elections, and um, they have a whole list of those locations by county. Now, we have done early voting before in the general election. So what did election officials learn from that? Um, I think that, you know, there were really no complaints about how it it worked. Um, there were a lot of poll workers because it was the first time to help people out, show them, you know, how to use. A, a, we had new machines, too. We also had new um poll books, electronic poll books that people signed in. These are really important because you don't want someone to be able to vote in one location and then go to another location and vote. Um, so I think that they, they felt that it worked really well, and it's just a case of going forward and seeing, you know, how how maybe we can get either more people to turn out or, or at least make sure that people know that, that this option is available. And you mentioned this option was due in part to COVID. Is this going to be a permanent shift? Should we expect that early voting will be Come part of the election season? Oh, yes, definitely, because there were a lot of states that did this even before COVID. Um, it was just not something that New Jersey had ever um, thought to do. I'm not quite sure why, but but COVID really brought it to the, the need for this um, to the fore, and it's, uh, it's definitely something that's not going to go away. And it's certainly early, but what do we know so far in terms of turnout with the mail-in ballots? Right. So we don't know. Uh, we, we won't know probably till early next week how this the early in-person voting turnout has gone. But as of um, the middle of this week, there were more than 210,000 people who had voted using mail-in ballots. And that's, uh, I think, five times larger than the number who had voted four years ago in the last um, congressional primary in a midterm year. So. Uh, um, Mail-in voting has certainly become more popular in New Jersey. Colleen, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rhonda. 
And make sure you join us on Tuesday for our Live NJ Decides 2022 primary night coverage. We will have all the final votes, plus political analysis and live reports from the key congressional primary races we're watching. That's 10 p.m. right here on NJPBS and streaming on our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel. COVID-19 vaccines for children under five could begin in just a few weeks. The White House says shots may be available as soon as the 21st of this month. The FDA is expected to meet a little more than two weeks from now to review data submitted by both Pfizer and Moderna. The agency will then decide whether to authorize the vaccines for emergency use. Meanwhile, New Jersey today reported nearly 3,900 newly confirmed positive COVID tests and 13 additional deaths. New Jersey's teaching shortage is only getting worse. A New Jersey Policy Perspective report finds that unless some changes are made soon, there will not be enough qualified candidates to replace teachers who are leaving. Melissa Rose Cooper looks at why it's been so difficult to attract new teachers and what efforts are underway to bring qualified applicants to the profession. We are seeing a clear decline over years in the number of people entering the profession and school leaders in New Jersey are telling us there is a problem. A problem that's only getting worse as several issues are adding to a grave shortage of teachers in the state. Mark Weber recently authored a report published by the New Jersey Policy Perspective highlighting a trend in which fewer and fewer people are entering the field. The number dipped below 3,000 for the first time two years ago. Uh, it went up slightly in the last year uh, that we have data, but it's still a very serious decline and it's a real problem. The report also revealing a decline in college students earning a teaching degree. In 2020, the number of teaching degrees given to graduating students at New Jersey colleges hit an all-time low with just over 3,500. That's an almost 35% drop from 2011, when over 5,300 teaching degrees were awarded. Education experts say one of the major issues why this is happening is money. Teaching does not have the same cachet as other professions. It's really hard to make sure that we are treating teaching with the um, degree of respect that it deserves. We need to be able to talk about teaching in the same way we talk about engineers, in the same way we talk about lawyers, in the same way we talk about doctors if we want people to see it as a desirable profession. Schools are also struggling to retain teachers once they're hired, many leaving after the first several years on the job. The salaries have not kept up with the pace of the changing needs in society. So it's really hard for teachers to go in making a lower starting salary and knowing they're not going to, their salaries are not going to rise at the same pace as inflation as it is in other sectors. But education leaders in Newark are hoping to change things around. The city's Board of Education and the Newark Teachers Union have agreed to raise the district's new teacher starting salary to $62,000 a year. I'm proud that we were able to work together with the district through our negotiation team to raise um, that, uh, that starting salary and to keep it there for the first six years of employment here. And at the same time, we didn't want to diminish the value of the of veteran teachers who have been here for a while. So we were able to raise um, theirs as well, keep it on the salary guide and make it pensionable. We have to get serious about having competitive wages to make up for all of the pressures that teachers are under. We have to shore up benefits. We need to do more to attract teachers of color because we know it's important to have them in the classroom. But our final recommendation is that we have to change the perception of the teaching profession. We have to start granting teachers the respect that they deserve. We have to trust them in our classrooms to do the right thing. Certainly they should be held accountable, but certainly they've got to feel like they have a say in what happens in their schools. The state is also making some changes to recruit more teachers. New policies from the state's Board of Education will allow prospective candidates to enter the field through an alternate route program. Candidates will be able to take courses to get a standard teaching certificate, even if they don't meet the required GPA or standardized test score. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. 
In tonight's Spotlight on Business, we highlight an Atlantic City casino story written by Press of Atlantic City reporter Allison Birdo as part of ProPublica's local reporting network. Her report details that despite growing profits, casino operators use predictions of grave danger to convince the state to slash their tax burden, denying millions of dollars to the city, its school district, and Atlantic County. I spoke with Allison earlier today. You've done an amazing amount of reporting when it comes to casinos and taxes in Atlantic City. What is the consensus of the people you spoke with about whether casinos are paying enough? So uh, that really depends on who you talk to. Um, the casino executives, um, they showed last year when advocating for this change to, to uh, a particular tax that impacts Atlantic City and Atlantic County that uh, they felt as though they needed some relief. Um, you know, there are advocates uh, within New Jersey who have said that, you know, these are big profitable businesses that should be paying more of a, fa of their, of a share. The casino business has rebounded, certainly since COVID, though. Yes. Yeah, so um, we saw last year that casinos' gross operating profits hit $767 million, which is the highest profits that the industry in Atlantic City has reported in at least 10 years. So looking backwards now, what was behind the change in Pilot? So... Um, just a little history here. Pilot is a stands for uh, payment in lieu of taxes. It's um, replaced the property tax system for casinos starting in 2016. So um, last year, uh, casinos uh, argued that the reason to change Pilot was um, they had not yet recovered from the pandemic, and um, also a second argument that. Uh, most uh, most of their online revenue stream from any bets that were made on uh, sports online or from casino games online, that they were not getting uh, a share, a lar as large a share of those profits as the numbers might seem, might make seem. Those profits are also going to um, third party operators, the tech platforms. Um, so th that was some of the arguments from the casinos. And then former state Senator Sweeney made the argument that Pilot had to change or else at, uh, four casinos could close. So it did change. And fast forward, here we are. What is the impact on the city? The city is losing millions of dollars that is needed quite, quite badly, to be frank. Atlantic City this year is going to, um, right now, under the new law, the new formula, will get about 90, uh, $91 million in tax revenue from um, the taxes in that pilot act. Um, if the law had not changed, they would have gotten um, $133 million. Where does this issue go from here? The pilot law was changed. We have a situation where casinos are saying one thing and looking at numbers. Officials are saying something else and looking at numbers. So how does the tension end? The pilot law is being challenged in court right now by Atlantic County. Um, since it replaced property taxes, which would normally go to the local Atlantic City School District, the city budget, as well as the county budget. Um, the county sued over the change in the law to preserve the amount of money that it would receive. Um, so the court has ruled in the county's favor, but the state is uh, continuing to um, make efforts to appeal that decision. Um, also, uh, you know, we're we're wondering um, what might happen. What might happen next? You know, now that this report is out, um, will we see anything happening in Trenton uh, about other taxes that impact the casinos and could benefit Atlantic City? Allison, it's been great chatting with you. Thank you for sharing all the work you did on your story. Thank you so much. Companies continued to staff up in May as the economy created 390,000 new jobs, according to the federal government's monthly jobs report. While that number was higher than expected, it does represent a slowdown in job creation and was the smallest monthly gain in more than a year. The U.S. unemployment rate held steady at 3.6 percent, which is the lowest level in more than 50 years. Here's a look at how the stock market closed out the trading week. Support for the Business Report provided by Martin Tuckman School of Management at NJIT, offering New Jersey's first Bachelor's of Science degree in fintech, 
business-focused, technology-driven, and Riverview Jazz, presenting the Jersey City Jazz Festival June 4th and 5th. Event details, including performance schedules and location, are online at riverviewjazz.org. And join me for NJ Business Beat this weekend. We put the state of the labor market in focus, highlighting the huge increase in job openings, the lack of workers to fill those openings, and how companies are getting creative to bring workers back. Watch it on NJ PBS Saturday at 5 p.m. and Sunday morning at 9.30. Concerns of a possible cancer cluster tied to Colonia High School in Woodbridge grabbed national attention earlier this year. But after weeks of on-site radiation testing, state officials have concluded the school and its grounds are safe. Those findings have not sat well with some community members. On this week's program, Chatbox with David Cruz, Joanna Gagas got reaction to the state's announcement from Al Lupiano. He's the whistleblower who compiled a list of more than 100 cases of former students and staff of Colonia High. Going into this process, we had never stated that radon and radiation were the only definitive um, tests that we should be performing. It was always meant to be phase one of a multi-approached uh, test. Um, they had done these tests early April, and my understanding was we would immediately go into air, water, and soil samples. So when the state had come out and Commissioner Sean LaTourette had stated that he's comfortable that there's nothing going on here based on only one test, never did we think doing a radon sample was going to be the be-all, end-all of the school study. Okay, just help us understand when we talk about radon testing versus other types of testing, what was done and what further testing would you like to see? So radon testing is no different than what you do when you're trying to buy or sell your home. They put a canister in your basement. It's exposed to the air. As radionuclides settle on the canister, they're collected. We send that off and we can give you a reading of radon in your house. We had intended for them to concurrently do soil borings, looking for subsurface problems, also pulling air out of soil borings to see if we have buried drums? Do we have chemicals? Do we have a plume of gasoline leaking from the nearby gas station? So we had anticipated them doing air sampling, which is looking for things that have volatilized into the school, as well as doing soil sampling, which is looking for things that are still in the soil that not only are volatilizing into the school, but also can be leaking down into the aquifer and spreading the contaminant across the town. So, Al, Department of Health Commissioner Judy Persichilli joined the press conference last week. She said, when we compare the rates of people in New Jersey against our cancer registry to see how many from a certain region we can expect to get cancer or expect to have certain brain tumors, in this case, because many of the tumors are not cancerous, the findings that Al Lupiano has uncovered are right in line with where we expect the population to be, kind of the risk of living here in New Jersey. What's your response? I don't understand all the numbers that they presented. So they're not sharing with us what the cohort size was. They haven't told us what the population they're looking at. Another problem I have with her conclusions, they're looking at a 50 year time span. These brain tumors have a 20 year latency. So including students and teachers that were there last year is simply silly. Those individuals are not clear of brain tumors they may not have developed them yet. So using a 50-year cohort artificially inflates the expected numbers. Now, I am working with a team of doctors and epidemiologists right now, and they are looking at the data. And their initial conclusions are, we know the rates of primary brain tumors, 10 out of 100,000. Their conclusion that our population size of Colonia High School should have 105 primary brain tumors defies logic. They're looking deep at these numbers right now, and I hope for them to report back to me in the next week and give me some clear direction on whether or not the state's conclusions are correct or incorrect. 
And before we leave you tonight, the next episode in our 21 Digital Film series is now online. The series examines the simple question of, does where you live in the state affect how you live? 21 profiles one person in each of our 21 counties and looks at the social determinants that affect the person's life. The latest film profiles Fallon Davis of Essex County, a passionate educator developing tools and resources to redefine the next generation through the arts and sciences, all while empowering others in the community. Take a look. I want Nork to be the black mecca of the world. What's going on? How you doing? Amazing. This is so dope. This is where a lot of black and brown culture is. We're so glad to have you. Your vibe is excellent. Thank you. For so long, communities like Nork have been left out. You don't realize that in this community, there are a lot of resources that are not available. This is what I wake up every day fighting to advocate for. Free water, free food, free programming, and really providing space where black and brown owners can find ownership here. You know, it's a big task we're up against. Where you live does affect how you live, especially when you're in an area with lack of access to fresh food. You can meet Fallon and the other extraordinary Jersey residents at mynjpbs.org backslash 21. I'm Rhonda Schaffler. For the entire team, thanks for being with us tonight. We'll see you back here on Monday and have a great weekend. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years.